have faith in God is not a stagnant state. It's a journey. As a believer, we should grow in our knowledge of God and His Word. Walk with Alan Cutting and many other believers as together we walk the believer's journey. Aloha and welcome again to the Believer's Journey and thank you again for joining us. Uh, we have a special program again called uh, Questions on the Fly. This is our 10th version or our 10th show we've done this and they've actually shown to be pretty successful. I do have a lot of questions and so therefore we're going to go through these and my guest and moderator today is Alejandra Arnold. Hola, hola. <laughs> Um, I have to tell you, Alejandra, if I, if I were to choose a daughter, she would be it. Um, she is so close to my heart and dear. She's a very close and special friend to me. And, um, and her, she's a PK. She's a preacher's kid. <laughs> You're going to make me cry. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but yes, I am. <laughs> so tell us about your church. Uh, we've actually had your dad on our program. Mm. Oh, yeah. I remember that. So yeah, our, the church is called Iglesia Vida Nueva, and you know, my parents have been pastors for a very long time, back in the day in Cuernavaca, Mexico, and then we moved to the U.S., and they haven't stopped ever since, so now they have Iglesia Vida Nueva, and we are so happy, it's growing, we have a lot of plants, and you know, it's great to be part of that ministry. And the church is located in Stone Oak, uh, San Antonio. So if you, and it's all Spanish speaking. So if you speak Spanish and you're looking for a church, uh, for a Spanish speaking church, there is a really neat church to go to. Um, or to learn a little bit of Spanish, you never know. There you Roll go. your R's. <laughs> 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 so anyway, um, and that is that. Carlos uh, Castanero, he is the pastor of the church. He has been on our program once before, uh, I think a year or two ago. And um, anyway, so that is that. <sighs> so let's go ahead and get right into the questions. We got quite a few of them, and we got some, I believe, are going to be long-winded. So we may want to start this off and, and go. Let's get it started. Well, I picked one that I think it's going to be a long answer, so here we go. This is coming from Moldova, and it says, Is it possible to lose your salvation? If you can, how can this happen? <clears throat> okay, so the age-old question of all right, once you're saved, you're always saved, you can never lose your salvation, or you can lose your salvation, has been an argument for at least seven, eight hundred years, okay? Um, and whatever I'm going to tell you, believe me, uh, there are people and there are scholars and there are theologians that are going to totally disagree with me. Um, however, I'm going to tell you this. I don't follow, and oh, let me tell you this. There's going to be basically two camps in the Protestant following. You have uh, um, Armenian Wesleyan camp, and those are the people that, that believe that uh, you can lose your salvation, okay? Uh, you have the, in those churches that are in that camp. You have the uh, you have the Pentecostal type churches, your Holiness churches, which are your um, Nazarene churches, your Free Evangelical or Free Methodist churches, um, Wesleyan churches. Those are churches on that side of the, the spectrum. Then you have your Calvinist churches, because Calvin is on the other side. I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, and you can never lose your salvation. Those churches are your Reformed Church, your uh, Presbyterian churches, um, Congregational churches, many of your Baptist churches are that way, not all of them, but most of them, and they don't all adhere to all five points. If you understand what I'm talking about in Calvinism, they may pick two or three of the points rather than all five. So you have two separate camps, and if you're familiar with the Protestant movement, you'll know you have one or the other. Then you have your, your Catholic and your Orthodox churches, and basically uh, those believe that you can lose your salvation. But it's nothing part of the two I just talked about because they were established beforehand and they believe you could mm -hmm. lose salvation. So, <clears throat> so the real answer is... <laughs> yeah, the real answer is, I tend to believe that salvation is uh, a, 
in the relationship with Jesus. I tend not to believe that it's in the structure of the, um, the theology where because I said a magic prayer that now I'm saved and forever saved just because I meant it in my heart that now I can never lose my salvation. I can go out and murder, kill people, and because I'm saved, I'm just backsliding and I'm going to heaven anyway. I can fool around on my wife. I could cheat people, steal. And there's a, there's a thinking of that. And I know there's a thinking also that in that group, they believe that if you're doing that, you never were saved anyway. So, and that's all for debate also. So I have a problem with that thinking. Uh, Jesus talks about, not only Jesus, the entire Bible talks about living in holiness in obedience, in righteousness, and in faith. And if you're living in those things, I don't believe you're going to run off and, and do, live in the wrong thing in, in, as a lifestyle. It's one thing to make a mistake. It's one thing to do something wrong as a sin. It's another thing to grab a hold of it as a lifestyle and you become your own God. I think that's where the key is. Yeah, I think just knowing that you have your salvation and that you're not going to lose it, then, oh, well, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. That's the fine line, right? As opposed to, like, doing it consciously or unconsciously. Because, as you said, mistakes. Mistakes happen, and, you know, it's, right. it's okay. We're all going to make mistakes at some point. But I think the fine line could be there, you know, if you're consciously doing it. And if you're asking for forgiveness, right? Because if you don't even, you know, ask for forgiveness from God, then what's the point? Well, and then there's the other side of the coin. I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but there's, there's the other side of the coin. There's those people on the Armenian Wesleyan side of, of the picture, your holiness group, who believe that if you, because what they define sin, Wesley defines sin as anything you do against a known law of God. So if you know that stealing is a sin, it's a known law of God, it's a sin, and you do it, then you've cut your relationship with God, therefore you're, you've lost your salvation. And I've heard people say that if you die before you ask forgiveness of that sin, you will go to hell. Hmm. So you've literally lost that salvation. The problem with that is the Bible doesn't teach that. And, and even Jesus, here's a perfect example. When Jesus was being tried, Okay, by Herod and, and um, oh, uh, the, the Jews, the mm -hmm. Sanhedrin. And uh, Peter was outside, and he was questioned whether and stated that he was one of the disciples or a follower of Jesus, and he denied that three times. And so we know that that denial, Jesus already said, if you deny me before men, the Father will deny you before, mm -hmm. okay, so basically, here he denies Jesus, and however, Jesus never, ever, ever came to him and said, you need to repent. Mm -hmm. You need to ask forgiveness. Instead, what Jesus did was, when he met with the other disciples, and Peter wasn't there, he said, make sure you tell Peter I love him. Hmm. And then when he meets with Peter... He stands before Peter, and he doesn't ask for, hey, you owe me an apology. <laughs> you, you need to forgive, ask for forgiveness. Instead, he says, do you love me? Hmm. So he, reached, he talks about it on a whole different level, and a level that is more about relationship rather than a religious mm -hmm. action. Right. So when we talk about losing, not losing salvation in the form of the theologies I'm talking about, I really do believe we're talking about acts of religion. Mm -hmm. Because it's that act that says, if I do something wrong, I lose my salvation. Well, that's, those are, that's an act of works. Let's, let's be honest. Like, if we were to do something wrong, that would be every day. Yeah. Every day we would be making mistakes, even a tiny little white lie, you know, like, tell, tell that person I'm not here. You know, it could be something <laughs> as simple as that. We would lose our salvation every minute you know yeah. so so i think that we need to realize that christianity and i've said this in the very first program i ever did christianity is absolutely not a religion mm -hmm. a religion by definition is something that we do on a daily basis on a regular basis in ways of worship so we go to church every single day, every single week, or twice a week. That's religious. Mm -hmm. We read our Bible every day. We, we pray every day. We do these things on, on a very regular 
habit. Mm -hmm. That's religious. That's actually religion. And there are a lot of people who do that who are not believers or Christians at all. Mm -hmm. So you can take that and you can do these things and realize that's not being a Christian. That's just, just following a religious religion. pattern. What if you go back to Judaism in the Old Testament, and even before Judaism, and you go to Adam and Eve, what did God establish in the garden? A relationship with them. He walked with them. Mm -hmm. He shared with them. It was all part of that. You go to Cain and Abel, and he talks to Cain. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about a relationship. God establishes this relationship from the very beginning of, of the creation of man. Mm -hmm. And God is a relational God. When we look at the laws, the laws and the problem of the laws during Jesus' time and Paul's time is that they were corrupted. They were mm -hmm. corrupted by the the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth. And so they were fighting against this corrupted you know, law that was given by God mm -hmm. that was totally misunderstood. Even today we misunderstand that. Right. In our churches today, we see things in a lot of the denominations, even in your non-denominational churches, you see all these rules and regulations and bylaws that happen to be very religious. Mm -hmm. And yet they're not necessarily always biblical. They might find biblical patterns within them. But then to say, for example, if you go dancing, it's a sin and you'll go to hell. Or if you go to the movie theater, or if you drink a, wine, a glass of wine, you'll go to hell. I mean, these are not biblical. Mm -hmm. And yet we have these in our churches, and yet these are religious practices man-made. Yet I feel like we can fall into that other side of the of the story where it's like, well, if I don't lose my salvation, or you're accepted the way you are, however you want to be, and you don't have to change anything because you have salvation already if you accepted yeah. Jesus Christ in your life. Well, see, the Bible says, in, in actually in the book of Hebrews, there are seven or eight warnings about turning away and falling away and, and moving, mm -hmm. not having God or Jesus in your life. Jesus says, um, you are my disciples if you remain in me. Now note the word remain. If you want to use the word abide in English, okay, abide in me. But the Greek literally means to remain ongoing to the end. So if we remain in him to the end, we are his. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Hebrews, it warns us about turning away. But what about the people that remain in him and they have him in mind like constantly, they think about God all the time, they pray, they read the Bible, yet they have their few sins, you know, constant sins that they want to ignore and put aside. So living in him and having sins and doing something wrong are two different things. So let's take the very very foundation of Christianity. The very foundation is that we believe in him, okay? Now there's a problem with that word believe in English, in Spanish, okay, Romanian, in Russian, all these languages I've looked up. The problem is we can look up in our dictionaries, and you can look it up in your Spanish dictionary, mm -hmm. that the word believe literally means that it's something we understand to be true. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the Bible, into the original language, in the Greek, and in the Hebrew word they use for believe, that Greek word, pistuo, is an active verb, not a passive verb as we see it today. Mm -hmm. It's an active verb. What does that mean? It means we under, it's something like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that whoever believes, whoever acts upon, follows the teachings of Jesus, they shall have everlasting life. It's not who thinks, understands he's true and real. Mm -hmm. It's that who acts upon it, who lives it. And when we understand that's how Jesus taught, that's how the entire Bible teaches, to obey is better than sacrifice. Oh, I sacrifice, I go to church every week, you know, mm -hmm. I go one hour, a whole hour every week, I sacrifice my Sunday. Mm -hmm. I mean, he says it's better than, obedience is better than sacrifice. You need to obey him. And it's, it's in the obedience, it's in the living in faith. Living in faith is also an active verb. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. We all stop at the first verse. Hmm. Always, people stop there. But if you read that entire chapter, which is called the fat chapter of faith, what does it say? It says, you know, that when Noah was told to build the ark, by faith he built it. 
-hmm. It wasn't that he understood that God wanted to do it by, by the fact that he doesn't see it happening, this and that. No, he actually built it. He worked on it. He was active. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I've, I've done this before on in, in a program before and in my teachings. If there's a chair sitting off to the side, I've been told that faith is knowing that if I sat in it, that it will hold me up. That's not faith. That's not biblical faith. Biblical faith, the action is standing up, walking over, and sitting in the chair. Mm -hmm. That is faith. So what does the Bible teach us about salvation? That we need to live it. Mm -hmm. That Jesus needs to be on the throne of our heart. That he needs to be center and focus of all of our life. Mm -hmm. And in that, we follow his teachings. Yeah. And if we're following his teachings and we screw up, we do something wrong, okay, so make it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible teaches that. When Peter, this is a good one. In fact, what, to your very question, in Galatians, uh, Paul gets upset with Peter because Peter is sitting with the Gentiles. And he's partying with them or having a good time with them. Then the Jews come along. He gets up and walks over the Jews. And the Judaizers, these Jews, are trying to force the Gentiles into having circumcision because that's the law. Hmm. Okay, And Paul called Peter a hypocrite because he was you know, acting one way, then acting the other, and, and not being truthful. Mm -hmm. And so Peter was actually acting as a hypocrite, doing the wrong thing. Did that make him not a believer, not a Christian? Absolutely not. But he needed to make it right. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. So we live in a relationship, okay? So if, if, if you have a husband or a, or a wife or a daughter or a son, you're in a relationship. If that person hurts you, does something wrong, lies to you, does that mean that they're no longer your relative? No, no. you've got to work on it. You've got to work on it. Yes, yeah. you make it happen. It's all about relationship. Mm -hmm. So losing your salvation, I don't believe there's such a thing as losing salvation. That is there such a thing as I can never lose it? There's no such thing either. I mm -hmm. think both of them are off base, and I think it's all about the relationship. You live in the relationship. You work on the relationship. If you want to decide that, you know, Jesus is no longer my, my Savior, my God, my Lord, but I'm going to make, you know, myself my God, or I'll make my car my God, or, you know, the cute girl down the street my God, or whatever, my church my God. Well, then you've got a problem. Now we're not talking about losing salvation. We're talking about making a choice to make someone else your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. And that's where I draw the line right there. That's where I say, you, it's not losing it, it's choosing. It's not about works. It's about your faith and what you follow. Yeah, just being more like Jesus, you know, being able to reflect that for people to, to know, to recognize that you're actually living proof, you know, that you're not going to be perfect, but you're going to strive to be more like Jesus every day, even if you mess up. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Okay, that's a long okay, answer. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the next question. This one's from USA and Moldova. Are Mormons Christians? <laughs> okay. Um... You know, and I didn't know that the Mormon church was so, they're really growing bigger and bigger in Moldova. I've noticed that, and I'm hearing more about that. Um, so let me break that one down, too. It's not as easy as saying yes and no, I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe that the Mormon church teaches a false doctrine. Okay? But that doesn't mean every person that goes to the Mormon church is not a believer. Okay, I believe that people who go to Baptist churches could be non-believers and some be believers. Same thing with the Nazarene church or your dad's church or whatever. You have people that attend just because they have the name above it that's Christian doesn't mean that they are personally a Christian. Mm -hmm. And just because you have people who go to the Mormon church, they may believe and have the understanding that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and be a total believer. However, if they're following the teachings of the Mormon religion, and order, notice I say religion mm -hmm. here, not relationship, religion, then we have a problem because now your God is that church because of their false doctrine. Mm -hmm. I have the journal and discourses of Brigham Young. Okay, not many people have this, but I have it. He, he was, he actually did a speech sometime, I don't know, 1852 or 18 something. And he said two things I thought were totally amazing. Now, before I get into that, the Mormon church believes that a prophet is a prophet, just like the Bible thinks a prophet is a prophet, as long as everything they say and do is absolutely 100% correct. Okay? 
So Brigham Young, which they believe is a total prophet, okay, said these two things. Now, whatever they say has to be true to the end. I mean, it is actually God's word. Mm -hmm. The first thing he said is that God did not want his son to be a bastard. This was the words of, of Brigham Young. So he sent Brother Adam to Mary, and they had a son, Jesus. Hmm. So in, in Brigham Young's words, Jesus was born from Adam, who was already has his own little planet and his own little God of his own little world, to have sex with Mary, and Jesus was born. Therefore, that's why Jesus was no, not a bastard, according to Brigham Young. So if this is absolutely true, which the Mormon Church does not believe today, then either Brigham Young was a total liar and not a prophet, or their esteem of Brigham Young is really bad. The other thing that Brigham Young taught which the, the Mormon Church does not hold today, is that people who are black are black because they're cursed by God and should never have, never attend or be belong part of the church. And yet today, there are bishops and everything in the church. So either God's word is God's word, or God's word is false, you know, within mm -hmm. this organization. So I think that the problem with the Mormon Church is that it's a false doctrine, you know, number one. There's actually a group called uh, Living Hope Ministries. They're out of um, Utah, and they have DVDs, and they, they, they're, they are scientists, and they're archaeologists, and they put out these DVDs. I have all three, or at least three of theirs. One's called The Book of Mormon versus the Bible. One's called The Bible versus Joseph Smith, and the other's like the DNA of uh, the Mormon Church or something like that. And it shows the Book of Mormon in that it has how the people came from Israel, because all the Mormons that came over uh, into the Americas came from Israel. They're actually Jews, according to the Book of Mormon. And the, all the Indians that we call or American Indian, North and South, all over, are actually from Israel and really Israelites. And so that's their teaching. And they had these big, according to the Book of Mormon, they had these big empires and cities that have had hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people and they had battles and war and, and so forth. So these archaeologists, while they were Mormons, went out to search this out and found there was no pottery, no bones, no, you know, weapons. They were talking about swords and things. Nothing at these areas. Mm -hmm. And they went to every area. The only area they could not go is the Mormon church would not let them go to the one in New York, which is their little spot. So they proved that there was no area that had any activity or any um, empire at all. And so these archaeologists no, boy, no. who were Mormons felt deceived and became and left the Mormon church and mm. became Christians. Mm. Okay, And then they put out these DVDs. This is one of them they put out. And they actually show you on that, the Book of Mormon versus the Bible versus Book of Mormon. Then there's one about Joseph Smith and how there's different prophets of the Book of Mormon who made uh, pr prophetic sayings and they looked at them at these different prophets and not one of these prophets of their prophecies ever came true. Hmm. Then they looked at the Bible at their prophecies and they all came true. Hmm. Then they looked at Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith made a uh, prophecy that in Missouri would be built the, uh, on the spot they have. They even have a sign there. I think it's Springfield, Missouri. I could be wrong, but it's mm -hmm. in Missouri. There's a sign there from that time that says from Joseph Smith that the Mormon temple will be built on this spot and a gen this generation will not pass away before it's built. The, the land is still there empty. Hmm. And that they're called Joseph Smith a prophet. So they're following somebody who claims to be a self-acclaimed prophet who did nev never did anything truthfully, you know, then his follower has lies in his teachings and so forth. So you're following a false teaching and false teachers. So mm -hmm. the Bible talks about in the end days, which I believe we are, about false teachings and false doctrines. And this is one church that I believe is one of them. I believe it's like the fourth fastest growing church in the world. Hmm. You know, but we, we need to be careful of this. Yeah, I met a few Mormons back in Alamogordo when we lived there, and they were amazing people. Honestly, like you could mm -hmm. tell by their actions, same thing, like more of their relationship and their actions could tell, like I could tell they were different, they were nice, they were amazing. But you know, 
again, like it comes down to yeah. the relationship and the religious part of it, I guess. And, and, and they're not consistent. I, I have friends and uh, who are Mormons, and I have two situations that I know of personally where there was a couple and they were married and the husband and they separated and they were separated for the longest period of time and the bishop of the mormon church or ward i should say mormon ward at, at the time would say you know keep praying because you want to get together so you are in your own world so you can be gods of your own world they, they believe in having becoming gods of an own, their own planet and populating it that's what they believe now. Elohim, which is the god of this planet, has spirit children, which are in heaven, you know, in heaven with his wives. And every time a physical person is born here, one of those spirit children enters that body, that child, and it becomes grows up with that. And that's what they believe. And they they would tell these women, these two women that I know, you need to get back, or you won't have your own world. Finally, after about two years on both of them, they went back to them. You need to divorce your husband and marry somebody who's a Mormon, so you can, you won't be left out of your own planet. So the teachings are, and they don't. They used to teach this door to door. They don't teach that door to door any longer. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like if they're growing, they must be teaching something a little more. They used to have a way, there was a little book, they'd open up and these little pop-ups come in the book and they would teach this very thing about the creation, about the planets, all that. They no longer teach that door to door. Mm -hmm. However, it's never left their doctrine. Yeah. Okay, so short yeah. answer? Yeah, <laughs> no. And it goes back to where are you, <laughs> yeah, you actually no, have yeah. a relationship. Is Jesus your Lord? You know, one more thing, in, in the Gospel of John, you know, uh, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, the words in, in the beginning means before anything else existed was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the mm -hmm. Word was, was God. God. Which we know the Word is Jesus, because down below, the Word became flesh and dwelt among them. In the in in their writings, they believe that a word is the Word is, is a God, is not really the God. And mm. so we believe differently. We believe that Jesus is actually, you know, God. Yeah, I bet there are tons of differences there yes. that we could talk about for days. <laughs> but we're moving on to the next question, and the next question is from the U.S. It says, I thought Jesus was supposed to be first place in your life. What do you mean when Jesus is, is to be center of your life and not first place? Okay, so I had a program recently that I talked about... Um, preeminence in uh, Colossians chapter 1, I think it was, um, where I said that I don't like, and this has been taught since I was a kid, you might have even heard this, yeah. that, you know, number one, God is first place, number two, family is second mm -hmm. place, number three, church is third place, mm -hmm. number four, your job, number five, and you go on to hobbies and all this. Mm -hmm. I, I really hate that. I, I think it's bad theology, bad teaching. I think it, it's not actually I don't think it's really scriptural what I taught was on my program and, and hopefully I can it, clarify it better is that Jesus is, needs to be the center and focus of every relationship right. so if you took a circle you like that I can't see the circle but if you took mm -hmm. a circle and you made it in a little bitty circle in the middle and you took pie pieces all around it and every pie piece was something in your life like your spouse or your parents or your family or your church or your job or your hobby or whatever it might be you list all those things in there the very thing that it has in, in common in common thank you is that Jesus is center and focus of every single one of those relationships in your life mm -hmm. in a in a, a list God is one two three and four and five by human nature every number below one will be in competition with the first place, mm -hmm. which means it's a constant battle. Uh, well, but it it might be true, you know, for most people, they might feel like, well, they put other things in prior priority. So it kind of makes sense. It, it totally makes sense the way you explain it, like a circle should be the center of everything, every relationship and everything. But as humans, we tend to prioritize certain things. So I guess in our brains, it makes sense to be like, okay, let's put God first in every decision. So maybe meaning God being first could be like, okay, before making a decision about where to work, I'm going to talk to my first priority. Let's talk to God about that. But the way you explain it, it makes total sense. Well, and, and the way you're saying it is, is right if we do that in all relationships. The problem I've seen growing up is that I've seen people 
who might spend a lot of time doing like something on number two or four, mm. four or three or whatever, then you have some church leader or some busybody person mm -hmm. tell these people, well, you know, you're not you're not praying more than you're working, or you're not reading your Bible more than you're your, with your hobby, therefore they're more important than you than God is. And they give, put guilt trips on people. Hmm. And so the way I'm explaining it with the circle and, and Jesus in the center, it doesn't matter because everything is connected to yeah. you. If Think of it this way. If God brings you things and people in your life, you accept them or disregard them. So if you accept everything you accept in your life, if you bring them into your life because Jesus has brought them in your life, they should remain centered and focused in the fact that Jesus is center of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to Colossians chapter 1, um, where it says that Jesus is the head of the church, okay, the, uh, the body, and he is preeminent. Now, I know that word is, is in King James Version. Uh, in the New American Standard Version, it says first place. But the word preeminent is really the word. And what it means is supreme. It means all in all. Hmm. That's different than first place. Yeah. So when Jesus is center here and all of these things are focused because of Jesus being the center of all those relationships, that means that God is now all in all of my entire life. Yeah. That's what that word preeminence means or su supreme means. It's more than just first place and all these other ones don't have a connection with first. It's the center and everything is connected. Yeah. And that's why I taught that that way mm -hmm. is because I believe that Jesus needs to be center and focus of all your relationships. And by doing that, now he's all in all of your entire life. Yeah. Not just, oh, well, let me check off this for, for reading Done. my Bible, <laughs> check off this because I make sure God's first place over here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's more than that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Because from the moment we wake up, we wake up, we got to give thanks to God because we're alive. Yeah. We're healthy. Then we have food. And then you go have your coffee and thank you, Jesus. And then you talk to your husband or your kids or whatever. And that has to be Christ-centered. So it makes total sense the way you explained it. Thank you for that. Um, next question comes from the Philippines. And it says, I am from Catholic Church. I am wondering if Jesus forgives sins and my priest forgives sins, why is it important to tell my priest my sins before I die and not Jesus? <laughs> okay, and I imagine this is a, a huge Catholic um, question for a lot of people, especially when they come across you know, Protestant thinking. Um, I don't ever want to negate the fact that the Catholic Church works in a um, uh, chain of command. And, and I do believe that it's healthy to go to a priest to confess your sins. You need to confess your sins somewhere, okay? To not just to get them off your chest, but actually to turn from what you're doing. It, it's not healthy to go to a priest to say, I did this today and I sinned yesterday and so forth and please forgive me of it. Then the next day you do, you forgive me of the same thing, the next day you have the same thing, or week by week. That's not healthy and that's not biblical. What we need to do is when we ask for forgiveness or when we confess our sins, it's that we confess them so that we don't continue them. If you read 1 John, he talks about that. We go to confess them, that we do not continue in our mm -hmm. sin. And so we need to do this, and it's healthy to do that. However, the question about asking forgiveness to God and Jesus, or the priest and Jesus, um, I've been told by some Catholic friends of mine that if you do, and I guess they have them listed in different, sins are different. You have a, Like they have worse to... <laughs> exactly, yeah. Like, a, like you have a... Like a list of the really 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 bad sins and right. not so bad sins. yeah okay so and it's important that you get to a priest to ask forgiveness of those really 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 bad sins or or you may go end up either in hell or in purgatory i mean that's what you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. and by the way i don't believe in purgatory so that's just just so you know <laughs> i don't want questions asked me though mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um so therefore the thing is is that in the bible um uh, when Jesus is on the cross and he, and he dies on the cross, something significant happens. In the temple, the, 
the um, veil in the temple, um, it was it signified the fact that we are separated from God, and only the uh, priest, the only the high priest, not any priest, only mm -hmm. the high priest can go from the altar past the veil to the Holy of Holies to go and, and sprinkle the blood onto the um, Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. okay, the, the seat. So therefore, the high priest had that, you know, connection with God and the people had the connection with the priest. Well, what happens when Jesus died was the, the veil tore from the top. That means, you understand this, this is several feet tall and it was several, it was very thick. A, a person could not go up there and tear the veil. So mm -hmm. God tore the veil from the top to the bottom, signifying that he opened up the way for us to have direct access to him. Mm -hmm. So now that I have direct access to Jesus, I don't have to go to a priest. Mm -hmm. Okay, If I want to, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think people that condemn Catholics for doing that, it, it, it's totally off. I think you're right. I think every sin or everything you're confessing with your mouth, even like when you're talking to someone about whatever, sometimes like your own thoughts, it loses power. So when you confess your sin to whoever it is, at least it loses a little bit of power. So confessing it to a priest, it makes sense. It, it's not required. It's not like if you don't do it, you're going to yeah. pay for it. But, you know, Jesus definitely is the way. Remember, Jesus said he will be with us always. Well, if he's our priest, because in Hebrews he says he's our priest, mm -hmm. right? If he's our Lord, because if we turn to him to, and confess him to make him the Lord of our life, if he's our Lord, our priest, our God, then we have direct access to him at all times, 100% of the time, day and night, always. Mm -hmm. So if you have a sin you need to confess, then Jesus is right there, mm -hmm. and you can do it. You don't have to go to a priest in order to have that cleansed off mm -hmm. your, your soul, if you will, yeah. in the Catholic, according to the Catholic tradition. But understand, it's okay to go to the priest, but Jesus is really your Lord, not your priest. Mm -hmm. And that's that really is bottom line. And really, who forgives your sins is not is not going to be the right. priest. It's going to be Jesus. Right. It's really the really Jesus who forgives you, not mm -hmm. the priest. Okay. Well, moving on to the next question from Moldova. Um, it says, you said that Jesus tells us to take his yoke and learn. How do we learn from a yoke? <laughs> and because I'm very Mexican, you got to tell me what a yoke is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a yoke is not, doesn't come out of an egg. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was wondering, you know. Uh, is it a little yellow? <laughs> so if you want to look up the scripture, it's in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to about 30, okay. And Jesus says, basically, I'm going to paraphrase it, um, that all who, you who are heavy laden or burdened down, burdened down with stuff, you know, come to me and I will give you rest. And he says, my yoke is easy. He uses the word yoke is easy mm -hmm. and my burden is light. So um, he's teaching that if we come to him, he'll lighten our load and he'll teach us the way of how to live. Okay. So what he's telling us is that he's going to, um, well, this is what a yoke is. So let, let, let's, let's go from there and I'll go back to this. If you have an oxen and you're, you're in the, uh, or an oxen, you you're need to make some furrows in the, in the ground. And a lot of us don't understand that. But if you're in a farm area, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's how you farm, you, you know, unless you have a tractor. You get an uh, ox, you put a yoke on them, and normally you would have another ox and the, uh, the second ox would be a younger one that needs to be trained, okay? These, the, it, it needs to be guided along the furrows. It teaches this one to make those furrows straight, okay? So what I'm saying is a yoke is a guidance system. Jesus says, take my yoke, take my guidance, mm -hmm. take my guidance system, and I will. My example. My, I'll make it easy for you. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll help you. My burden, you know, it, it, what I have is not hard. So take my yoke is take my guidance. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm teaching is is that, you know, when what was the first part of that question? Um, Jesus tells us to take his yoke and learn. Okay. So yeah. So Jesus is saying, take my guidance, 
and learn from me. Mm -hmm. Okay, take it on. Just like a, a young ox would take, would be part of the yoke for an older ox to train them, to guide them along. So mm -hmm. Jesus is saying that he wants to do the same thing. I actually teach this scripture a lot to say that Jesus teaches that Christianity isn't all that hard. You know, what makes it hard is us. <laughs> you know, he's in all the, and the worries of the world. And once we start, start living in the worries of the world, you know, we have, we're burdened down. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, come to me, entrust your life into my hands. Now, I'm not saying trust in him. For example, I give this, I give this um, example. Let's say, let's say, Allie, you want to borrow my car. Alan, can I borrow your car? You know, and so I say, well, sure, here's my keys. I give you my keys. I trust that you will not crash my car. Mm -hmm. That's trusting. That's a very passive thing, believe it or not. Okay, what Jesus is saying, take my yoke and learn from me, it's a very active thing. So mm -hmm. Jesus is saying, I will teach you. And he's saying that Christianity, or life in me, isn't all that hard. It's easy. I will help you. So now, let's change that. So now you're coming to me and saying, I'd like to borrow your car. Uh, can I borrow your keys? And I'll say, here's my keys, but let me come with you and I'll sit shotgun. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing something totally different. I'm entrusting my life into your hands. Mm -hmm. It's more than just saying, here's my keys, go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, Jesus, go ahead and do it, you know, and, and we'll see what happens. It's like, okay, let me get in with you. And maybe along the way you'll be like, go to the left because there's going to be lift, less traffic through the air. Yeah, it's his guidance. That's exactly <laughs> what road. it is. So that's, that. In, in my teaching of the yoke, that's what I'm teaching, is that too often a lot of, People teach that Christianity is too hard. It's real hard. It's real difficult. And Jesus is saying, if you if you can entrust your life with me and take my guidance, my yoke, my guidance, you know, I will lighten your load, and you can learn from me, and it's easy. He says all that right in those those verses. Yeah. And it's chapter. It's Matthew chapter eleven, verses twenty-eight to thirty. Matthew eleven. All righty. Well, moving on to the next question. This one's from the Philippines as well, and it says, what is the ransom gift of God? <laughs> well, that's the short answer. <laughs> the ransom gift of God is Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Uh, God ransomed him for our salvation. And the fact that Jesus went to the cross, you know, for our sin, was ransomed. Awesome. That, that was easy. <laughs> Straight to the point. This one's from Texas. Woohoo! Since the New Testament in our Bibles is translated from Greek into English, why isn't the English name of Jesus used? Actually, the English word is used. Jesus is the English word of the Greek word. The Greek word is, is uh, spelled I E S O U S, Jesus, or Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus. I was going to say, Jesus is definitely used in, in Mexico. So. Jesus, but it's spelled like Jesus. J -E -S -S -S. Exactly like yeah. 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 The Greek word is I. Well, you know, it, it, the word J is actually a newer word, letter added to the English language, you know, later on. Mm -hmm. Like, Jerusalem was spelled Jerusalem, is how it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. You added the J, made it Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Jehovah, Jehovah. So the J is new. Mm -hmm. uh, so back in Jesus' day, the word Ye Jesus, Jesus, I think is how you pronounce it. But it's I E S O U S, is the Greek word for Jesus, which the Old Testament, which actually from the Old Testament is Jacob. Okay, which means salvation, you know, the salvation of God is with us. And so, uh, our salvation, God of salvation is salvation. So, Jesus is, in fact, the English translation from the Greek word, Jesus. But it is interesting, though, that maybe because of tradition, nobody uses the name Jesus for, to name their kids, right? Except in Latin areas. Yeah, oh yeah, we are different. <laughs> but that is very interesting because, yeah. I mean, I do believe that there's a lot of traditions that you're like, well, just in case, I'm not going to be that one. I don't want to go to hell in case, whatever, well, you know. Well, just like, who, said, who names their child Judas? Mm. Oh, well, that, that's, that actually happens, right? I don't know. I've never met I a Judas before. I, I did. In Mexico. Really? Mexicans can be really weird, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not responsible, though. <laughs> and you're a Mexican saying that. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I don't know if it was with an S at the end. That that might have oh that might have made the difference. I can't remember. Got to <laughs> Okay. Next question. Uh, yeah, I haven't asked this one. It, it's from the United States, and it says, "I heard that there is real power in speaking in tongues and the gift of this, the gifts of the spirit. I don't know why, but I have not personally seen or experienced this real or great power, even though I speak in tongues." Can you help explain and share why I haven't, or how can I experience this power I hear so much about? Oh, wow, <clears throat> that might be a long one. How much? We fifteen <laughs> minutes. Okay, so the power. I was just talking about this to somebody earlier uh, today. Uh, the power that we want, or we desire, or I think that God can give us. Is, is not in the gifts. I, I want to say that really up front. Um, I know that, and I have a, lo a lot of uh, Pentecostal and charismatic friends, I really do, and I've had one pastor from a Pentecostal church here, and uh, he's one of my closest friends. And I have to say that the power doesn't come from the gifts. We need to establish that, number mm -hmm. one. The power that we c receive from God that has miraculous outpouring is from our submission to His will. Mm -hmm. It's our yielding of our lives to Him. That's where the power comes from. Now, that being said, when we read the book of Acts and, in, and also other parts of the New Testament and even in the Old Testament. I mean, there were miraculous things that happened and people did miraculous things and people seemed to have power uh, in, in, in both Old and New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, you see this. But I think that what makes the difference is that these people were so dedicated and so submitted to God's will that God was, like I said, they're all in all, okay? One of the things that I, I, I said to somebody, they said, there's power in the speaking of tongues, and I said, no, there's not. And, oh, yes, there is. Said, no, there's not. The power comes in when I submit my will to, to mm -hmm. his. And then he... I'm calling out his name. And actually, he literally said, you're right. Mm -hmm. I says, I know I'm right. That's how the Bible reads, mm -hmm. you know? The thing is, is that when we look at our lives in the Spirit, where are we? The Bible in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says that we need to walk by this, the fruit of the Spirit. So we read about the fruit of the Spirit. What are those items that we read in there? Those items are literally the characteristics of God. So when we look at what our lives are supposed to be. Like, um, let's take that circle again. And let's put God in the center and let's do all that little spoke thing. And let's put like love, joy, peace. Okay? Let's Amor, put, gozo, paz, paciencia, benignidad, bondad, mansedumbre, templanza. There you go. So you have those things. And you have other things in there. Obedience, you know, or, or almighty. You have all these uh, other parts. Forgiveness. Jealousy. All these things are part of God. It's part of his characteristics. The Bible says and teaches that we need to be holy as God or because God is holy. So if we take that circle of God in the center and all those attributes, we need to seek after that. That's the way God created us. We aren't that anymore. We're, it's all perverted. It's all corrupted mm -hmm. because of sin and time. So we need to seek after that. Once we seek that and submit our lives to him and, be, and make God the center of our lives and seek to become like him, like Jesus, Jesus says in John that uh, if you have one everlasting life, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. So what is he talking about? He's talking about becoming like him, making him the Lord of your life. So if we become like Jesus, mm -hmm. What are we becoming? Back to the circle. 
God in the center and all these attributes. We're becoming like this. Mm -hmm. And so as we become in this, because in Genesis it says I, I made man or make man in my image, in my likeness. We're talking about moral likeness. So if we seek that, that gives us power. When we have the gifts of the Spirit on top of the fruit of the Spirit, which is God's attributes, now we're adding the power together. So then we look at what we can do with the two together, then we have like superpower, like mm -hmm. we see in Paul, like we see in John, Apostle John, and we see in, you know, Ezekiel, mm -hmm. you know, in the Old Testament. We have that superpower because we now are looking at and living the very fruit of the Spirit, and we're living in the gift of the Spirit, which is not to give us just power because of power. It's given to us so that we can become united as a the church of God and the body of Christ to become one. That's the purpose of the gifts, is to unite us. Yeah, it's interesting because in, in Mexico, I remember back in the day, you would hear of these people that would speak in tongues and you wanted to go to them so they could pray for you and you know it made it seem like they were closer to god that they were at a different stage level of spirituality that you could be healed you know but that same power we have access to that same power it's just a matter of yeah how close we are and how and i think we need to be careful all of everybody who's seeking one gift like tongues mm -hmm. god may want be wanting to give you a gift of teaching or, or a gift of healing or a gift of preaching or a mm -hmm. gift of hospitality uh, something else so we need to be open and to what God what the Holy Spirit is going to give us for a gift and Paul says not everybody's going to have the same gift yeah so that means we have to not everybody's going to speak in tongues not everybody's mm -hmm. going to be an interpreter not everybody's going to be a healer not everybody's going to be a teacher so we have all the different ones to form the unity for the body of Christ is there a specific number as far as how many gifts you can I don't believe there they're is. out there if you look at First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, and you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and you look at Romans, I believe it's chapter 12, it could, be, it could be 11, it's right around there. Those three books and chapters talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, and there's different ones, so when we put them together, we start seeing that there's more than just the ones we see in, in First Corinthians. Wonderful. Do we still have time? We have time. Right okay. Now. Um, okay, here's another one from Africa. I wish for my life to have power like the apostles in the Bible. When Jesus said we can do great, greater miracles than him, did he mean just the 12 disciples or did he mean all believers forever? You know, I'm so glad I got a question from Africa. You know, because I see there's little pockets of, of people watching from both Ethiopia and Kenya. Yeah, and it's really from cool. all over the world. That's there's amazing. Not, there's not that many, you know, but yeah. there's a few. So it's kind of cool that, that I get that. Okay, so um, the uh, actually this falls right into what I'm just talking about. Yeah. It really does. So if you want the power of God to be evident in your life, I truly believe you need to be 100% submitted to him in all things of your life mm -hmm. and you need to seek to become like Jesus and in seeking to become like Jesus you need to know what his characteristics are that's why you go to the fruit of the spirit that's why you go to the when he talks about what are the attributes of God when you seek those things and you're you're focused on that then as the spirit brings you a gift okay and it, it's like it blossoms it becomes powerful and within that, then can come another gift. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these apostles had more than one gift. Mm -hmm. So, but I really believe if you don't seek that which is centered in, in Jesus mm -hmm. to become like him, if you don't seek that and you're seeking a gift, you're going to miss it. Mm -hmm. You're going to miss the power. You're going to miss the very essence of what it's teaching about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does for us and is supposed to do for us. Yeah, sometimes it seems like the miracles that happened back in the day, they seem more amazing than the ones we see today. But I guess because of technology, it's so much easier to say like, oh, well, it was the doctors or this or that. And, you know, people coming 
rising from the dead, you know, and being healed and things like that. And nowadays, it's kind of easy to not see those miracles, but today we see tons of miracles, and that's because G Jesus is still working, you know? I think, though, there's a lot of areas where we don't see miracles, and I think that's because there's a lot of Christianity that's been watered down. And we live in a compromised church or a compromised city or a compromised home. We, we live, comp we compromise our, our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of it, look at it today. Or I guess we, we're busy, right? We're so busy, so we get <clears throat> super distracted and we can really recognize what's really happening and we can miss all the miracles that we've gone through, you know? Even just driving here and, you know, not being part of that accident that was back there. Well, and I think the Bible teaches a lot about that. I mean, Jesus gave a, a scripture, a parable about the seeds on the stony, mm -hmm. in the stony rock, in the mm -hmm. good soil and bad soil. And also in the Old Testament, it talks about, you know, uh, keeping the Sabbath day holy unto him. It's his day. And what we've turned into now, I mean, when I was growing up and for several years of my life, I went to church Sunday morning. I rested with family the afternoon or spent time with the pastor. And just in, in it was because it was God's day. And then mm -hmm. again, church in the evening, you know, and we had that day was solely God's day. Mm -hmm. We went to church on Wednesday, but we had that day. It was always like that. Now we plug in Saturday. Sunday morning, a lot of people go for an hour, maybe two hours, and we're done. Mm -hmm. Now we go play golf. Let's go to work. Let's, you know, and now it's my day. I gave God his hour, his mm -hmm. two hours, but God said, I want the day. Mm -hmm. So we've compromised our entire lifestyle, and who's on the throne? Is it us or is it God? Yeah. And so when we want power, we talk about that power again. Are we talking about we've actually put God on the very throne of our life? Or do we kind of say, well, in this area... There's a really neat little booklet I'm going to share. It's called uh, "My My Heart, His Home" or "My My Heart, His Home." It's a little booklet. And it's about a guy who owns a house, and Jesus comes and knocks on the door, and you know you let him into your living room, and he looks around while you know, and you talk about how the living room looks really nice. I've kept it up really cool because that's what everybody sees. And Jesus wants to walk into you know a, clo a closet. <laughs> well, no, I don't know if I want to let you in there, Jesus, because I've got some pretty bad sin in there. Mm. And so, you know, it's all about do we open our entire heart and our entire lives and everything to him, or do we keep closets closed and locked and bolted because we don't want Jesus to go in there, mm. and so therefore we keep ourselves on certain thrones, which in reference keeps us from the absolute huge power that this person is asking about wanting to have, mm -hmm. you know, for God. And I think that all connects, you know, to the previous conversation or the earlier conversation about Jesus being at the center of everything. So it, you don't only have to spend one hour at church on Sundays, but you get to spend every day and every decision. Wherever you go, you can talk to him. And yeah. when you recognize that, there's a lot of power too. And, you know, and so my wife and I own a business. And we try to operate this business as a Christian, as Christians. It's not a Christian business because we sell flags and banners and it's custom made and you know everything about my business. Mm -hmm. So, um, but basically when things happen and the customer is wrong but needs to be fixed or is partially wrong, we usually always, and I say that usually because sometimes it, it's hard, take the approach of, okay, does Jesus want me to do this or that? You know, how do we, how do we respond as Christians, as, you know, showing people, the customers that, you know, God is on our throne, that he runs our business, that our business isn't owned by me, you know, it's owned by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when we can pro portray that our business is owned by Jesus, that takes a whole new light than it's owned by me. Mm -hmm. See, and so that's why I say every aspect, Jesus needs to be center and right. all in all. Mm -hmm. I mean, every area, area. You know, I mean, business cards, I don't even put that I'm an owner. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, all I am is just a, some kind of manager, mm -hmm. you know. It's interesting how all these questions ended up connecting with each other and, you know, like, you can grab from this question and this question. It all, it all yeah. comes down to what, that one thing. Well, you know, walking, that's why we call it the believer's journey. It, we're, we're believers. We're on a journey, and we're trying to 
become like Jesus and find out what the truth is in what God wants us to do and become. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've, I've read a lot lately about, you know, what does Jesus save us from? You know, does he save us from sin? No. He saves us from the consequences of sin. Hmm. So, you know, what are the consequences? Well, most of us know what the consequences are, we, but we don't want to live in the consequences. Mm -hmm. We want salvation from the consequences. So what is that about? Making Jesus Lord of your life. Right. Following and living in his teachings. Believing. Amen. So, well, that was a pretty good show. Yes, it was fun. <laughs> Thank you for having me over. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I really do appreciate everything you said today and, and, and part of the program. It was good. I learned a lot. I well, learned about the yoke, at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for uh, joining us today. And everyone, have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. And uh, thank you again, and aloha. Aloha.